Sir S. Sharma ji for giving me this opportunity uh, and inviting me on this Teachers Day. It's a real honor and privilege to be invited to this prestigious institution, which has been doing a fantastic job in the area of developing young uh, professionals in the field of management and many other areas and serving the nation in multiple ways. Also, all my fellow colleagues on the dais, uh, especially uh, Anupama Rena, uh, with whom I just came to know that we have spent some uh, difficult times during 1990. So thank you very much for reminding me about those days. And also on the dais, uh, uh, we have Almunai's uh, Mrs. Gupta. So this is also a privilege to be uh, along with all of you and all the dignitaries here, Professor Saab and especially you, you have been insisting a couple of times to be here. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, how much time I have? <laughs> I must know my limits. <laughs> you would love, but uh, I think too much of talking people may not love. But I'll still try to finish quickly. Uh, See, we are in this uh, uh, in this program today. First of all, we must pay our uh, reverence, homage to Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. It's because of him. Uh, had he not initiated and advised his students at that time that this day should be commemorated in the name of teachers, maybe uh, we would have been with the 5 October. That is the National Teachers' Day. So all credit goes to him. So uh, uh, I think we must pay our homage and reverence to him. Uh, to begin with, we are in the 75th year of independence. This is what we are celebrating today. And uh, I tell to everyone, because I have a transition from army to then to corporate and then to government institutions. So this has been a wonderful experience transitioning here. I'm still learning how to be a good teacher because you, you work with the academicians and they do a fantastic job. But when you uh, look at them from... Uh, uh, from a person who has not been in the teaching, so you have a different way of looking at the teaching, especially when you come from an industry side. So being in the 75th year of independence, I have always been asking people, we fought for independence. Our, uh, our forefathers fought for independence and the reason was that we wanted to do something of our own. We wanted to do something with a free will. We wanted to do something which is aligned and tuned to our individuality, our potentiality. Because we felt as Indians we have phenomenal and enormous potential that we can deliver and make our nation proud. But because we were governed and ruled by the colonials, we, 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 we fought against them. And ultimately we got the independence. So in 75 years, the one question I always leave people and to me, myself as well, have we really uh, been able to understand our individuality, understand our potentiality and deliver something out of it for the larger good of the nation? If as a teacher today, if as a person who is creating so much of knowledge in the society, if after 75 years we still feel we are doing something for our own selves, we may be making house, we may be buying car, we may be having our children growing and sending them here and there for good job and good business, but is that what is expected out of a teacher today? So. My, my, my opening remark is that as a teacher in an independent nation, 75 years of legacy that we have, please ask a question to yourself. Uh, have we delivered to the potentiality that we have? We can do many things. We have seen uh, or we have many countries around us who have got independence after us. But today, if you look at those nations, I don't want to name them. Most of you are familiar with them where they are and how they have grown and what their uh, education has done for them. I still feel our education has not served that purpose for which this education or this nation was famous for. We used to be called so Chiviya. So when I asked my father and many people, why did we, why, why did we call so Chiviya? And then I realized we were not called so Chiviya just because, uh, you know, India was good. It was because the kind of education system we had in this India. The Gurukuls is one part. You had universities like Takshila, Nalanda, Somapura, Udantapuri, Vallabhi, Kantanur, Shala, one after another. 
best of the best universities and the people coming from all over the world from difficult terrains many people they never reached india but they still wanted to come to india because they wanted to get education in india because something different was happening in india and the outcome of the difference was we had so many innovations you go to any field you go to science architecture you go to bridge making canal making you go to metallurgy you go to metal science you talk of any area that uh, that that education had brought revolutions in india hum log i was in australia i was surprised to see that there was a uh, you know statue of one maharishi so i thought it is some maharishi but when i looked at the bottom of it it was uh, written about uh, uh, what we call him uh, maharishi uh, the 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 the, Ma the maharishi who gave us the artificial uh, surgery the surgery the shell chikitsa uh, sushut maharishi sushut i was surprised to see maharishi sushut inside the university and they mentioned as the father of uh, surgery similarly you had maharishi charak what a beautiful doctrine of charak samhita he has given to us you go to any field every field was full of innovations and inventions that india had created it was only because of the education that we had then you read any author faiya zinjiang yunsong what they talk about india so something has happened in uh, in india that has actually uh, brought us to a situation like this but uh, i read one another gentleman his name was uh, he wrote a book uh, uh, angus medicine his book is very famous you must read that he is an economic advisor he was an economic uh, historian he wrote a book by the name uh, its, its name is uh, the contours of the world economy you know what he did he did a phenomenal survey of the whole world from 1st century ad until 17th 18th century and you will be surprised to see today our gdp is 5% of the total global gdp what angus medicine has uh, you know written in his book a well researched book that india's gdp percentage contribution to the global gdp in first century ad was 35% can you imagine a nation we were in first century ad but then if you read more research institutions there is sri dikal lanaraman institution in bangalore they say before first century ad we were even up to 50% of the global gdp because we were a huge metal economy connecting from indonesia to haifa in uh, israel there was a trade route that was happening in between india and india had got so much of wealth coming from all over the world to buy what india was producing in the form of knowledge or products or services that it was giving but something happened and uh, we had the mccauley coming in and he uh, you know pushed everything on us he wanted to break the beautiful tree that uh, india had created and unfortunately we are where we are but anyway wherever we are we still have that lamp that light inside us we still have that dna of our ancestors and that dna again and again i tell my teachers my people around whom i work there is still huge potentiality in you you are not supposed to go and teach only in the class that is not your objective if teaching was the objective then you are not the teacher your objective is even bigger building the nation creating such wealth in the nation creating innovation in the nation making this nation look back again like that uh, what we call the sone ki chidiya and that only teachers can do no one else can do in this world so that is my uh, that's my another thing that i wanted to uh, talk about as we move forward look at the nations what's happening with them look at what they are doing look at your uh, neighbors most of the nations today are protecting themselves in terms of their the the innovations they do the technology they bring in and they call it techno nationalism i think india also needs to get up now you only don't need to go and do a job and uh, get a fat salary and that's the end of the life do something in your respective role something for the nation that grows nation while you grow you earn salary you make your family you make good wealth you make good houses but at the same time make sure you are contributing to the growth of this nation you are contributing strengthening this nation in all forms and you are making sure that this techno nationalism or a nationalistic feeling that makes india uh, to grow through your contribution does not go away students here you may go to any company you may work for any company but at the end whatever you uh, whatever you earn from that process make sure you contribute in one way or the other way for the growth of this nation 
for students here who are uh, who are uh, working very hard to get a degree and then go and work in the uh, corporate environment i have been in the corporate for many many decades i worked for ibm for almost 15 years before that a manufacturing company and after that last i was working with schneider electric as a director hr one thing i must tell you all of you the every day things are changing so fast the shelf life of knowledge and skills becoming very very small so what we learned couple of years decades back and then use it for couple of years it's not happening today in the industry in industry today the business models are shifting from a linear business model to a non linear business model between headcount and revenue you go to more, many companies all new companies startups are all good technology companies you will find that linearity between headcount and uh, revenue was earlier you know we, the business will grow say 100 million dollars the people will be 100 business will go to 200 million dollars people will be 200 but today that is not happening the linearity is breaking it's becoming non linear where the business Will grow to 500, and the headcount will be only 50. So, putting a terrible pressure on the people. So, the thinking skills are changing. And if today you are not able to understand the importance of those thinking skills, and teachers are not making sure that they create such an environment inside the institution to prepare you for those ambiguities that is happening inside the industry, believe me, you will not grow. in ibm we used to do surveys for who are the best leaders ibm competencies we used to do, we developed many many years back but you know what we did we tried to find out across the globe who are the successful leaders and among the uh, top 3 when we tried to find which of those top 3 skills and one of them was the leaders who handle ambiguity who take decisions in the ambiguity who manage people well who have the ability to collaborate and network across the organization and all that uh, you may not be today reading or studying in your books it all can come when such such assignments such activities such projects such tasks are given to you that will expose you to understand how decisions are taken in the industry because the moment you hit the or knock the door of the industry believe me on day 1 you are expected to deliver on certain decisions that are expected from the students coming from management institutions i remember um, when i uh, i joined this university it was my first day and uh, i uh, had to go and meet the chief secretary of the state uh, how i joined this that's a different story but the day i joined it my first interaction was with the chief secretary the first question that came in was uh, what will you do in the skill university and honestly i had no answer to it and in fact when i went to many people believe me i went to many forums i had no office the first three months i had only two letters one letter was letter of appointment as a vice chancellor the second letter was 85 acres of land given in palwal and that was the only asset i had received from the government so i went to the chief secretary and asked sir where is my office he said go and find out i said who are the people going to work with me he said it is all you who have to find it out first four months i was virtually on the roads but i had learned in my uh, previous organizations how to work uh, without an office because we worked in ibm for most almost 3 years uh, work from home so i started working with laptop and dongle and started working from kavi cafe coffee day sometimes barista and sitting there and writing to public works department or writing to municipality and all that and uh, i i remember even today if you go to my university and ask the teams now who have come and joined us they will tell you uh, where did we start they will tell you that we started uh, under the mango tree because we had no place to sit and that's how this university started and that's how the ideation happened many people in the first year actually criticized us they said uh, government has done a big blunder there should not be any university so it's a very important statement because any forum i used to go in the first year the first thing i used to hear from people was why did the government make a skill university there was no need so many universities already there and believe me today after 5 years there are eight states who have already initiated skill universities in their states and there are seven more states who are now in the process of creating a draft and the state act and believe me all these eight universities which have come up sir all of them have been taking consulting from the skill university all of them have been coming to our university to find out what good they are doing now 
have we done very good no if you ask me on a scale of 10 we are still at 1 we have a lot of distance to cover and do you ask do you feel to, today that we need a skill university no i don't think we need a skill university every university can be a skill university the only thing is the mindset with which these universities are today operating the culture that has been built in these universities is actually preventing them from becoming a skill university so there is a need to have a skill university so that a new blood new thinking new idea new vision can be brought in and that's how and last i must tell you to students the best teacher is your time the best teacher is your difficulty the best teacher is your problem whenever there is a problem whenever there is a difficulty whenever there is a complexity thank god that you are the one who has given you this opportunity if you do not go through those you will never learn and time is the biggest biggest teacher so once again thank you very much for giving me this opportunity